Well, it is my honor and my pleasure to be here with you today. What a great event. Thank you to the Children's Aid Foundation. Thank you to the ministry for representing uh, the work in Ontario so well and to all of our friends and colleagues who are here today. Um, you know, T.S. Eliot in his poem, Four Quartets, said, home is where one starts from. Home is where one starts from. That notion of family and home is tightly woven in almost all of human creations, from art to literature to music to theater. It is where we identify ourselves as individuals, where we build communities and societies and provinces and nations, home and family. And yet, for so many of our most vulnerable children, children who have been abused or neglected or abandoned, home too often is a wish or a hope or a fleeting notion. You know these numbers, but it's important first to remember that here in Ontario last year, according to the Children's Home Society's organization, um, uh, more than 170,000 reports of abuse or neglect were filed. And of those reports, more than 80,000 investigations were completed. Remember, these numbers represent individual children individual children who have been harmed and who need care. And, and last year, 23,000 children had circumstances that rose to the level that those children had to be moved into substitute care, into foster care, into some place other than their home, which was not safe enough for them to be. And last year, today, actually, more than 7,000 children in Ontario have suffered abuse or neglect that is so egregious that the courts have said, you cannot go home. You will be permanently separated from your family of origin, and now we will find you a family, an adoptive family. And there are actually 1,000 more children moving toward that status. So it's important to talk numbers, and it's important to gather statistics. But sometimes I know that when we talk numbers, the public glazes over. It's too much to think about. It's a stadium full of children that need help. So we always have to take it down to one, to one child, one story. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I would love to share the story of Philip. This is Philip. Isn't he beautiful? Right? We met Philip a couple of years ago. Um, he has a typical story of so many of the youth gathered here. Um, he was the youngest of eight siblings. His father was absent. His mother had severe mental health issues that didn't allow her to care for her children. So each of those eight siblings wandered in and out of foster care most of their lives. In fact, Philip wandered in and out of foster care for eight years, including the last six years of his life. He moved in and out of seven homes. He attended six different high schools. Philip is also biracial. Philip is gay. And too often, he shared in those each different high school as he was the new kid in town, he was often taunted or bullied or teased as the white kid, the black kid, the gay kid, the foster care kid. But Philip rose above those labels, and he knew that there was a, a joyous life ahead of him. That's what he carried in his spirit. Um, and so he worked his way. He aged out of, high, out, of, out of care at 18. But he knew that um, college was important. He graduated from technical school. And then at age 19, he was horribly diagnosed with a rare and aggressive kind of cancer that doctors said he had six months. He said, you know what? My challenges in foster care have prepared me for cancer. Now there's a statement, right? My challenges in foster care have prepared me for cancer. And he, for a year and a half, uh, went back to school. He was majoring in journalism. Uh, he was gathering people around him. He was creating a life that was full of promise and hope. Two weeks ago, we heard that Philip had passed away. And what we also heard from the caseworkers that gathered in his hospital room um, was that he held on to them and they held on to him. But there was no parent to hold his hand as he suffered through the end stages of cancer. There was no parent to comfort him. And two days before he passed away, he looked up at one of his former caseworkers and said, who will bury me? Who will bury me? No child should be put in the position of asking that question. We fail too many of our children too often 
the day that children are separated from their family of origin, our promise as politicians, as policymakers, as child welfare leaders, as foster parents, as potential adoptive parents, as foundation leaders, as community leaders, anyone who is vested in the care of a child, our promise to them is we will find you a family. And too often we break those promises, but we don't have to. Nearly a decade ago, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption buried under, burrowed underground and said, why are children, particularly older youth, children in sibling groups, children with mental or physical challenges, children who are in institutional or congregate care, why are these children aging out of foster care when our promise, our moral duty to them was to find a family? Why are we failing these children? And so we asked organizations across North America, why can't we get these children adopted? And I guess you could guess what their answers were. Right? We don't have the human resources or the financial resources to focus on children once they're on the adoption track. We are triaging critical cases of abuse and neglect at the front end of the system, and we have to get those children through the system. Once they're on the adoption track, they're okay. They'll be fine. We'll help them age out of care. And we said that wasn't enough. And so we looked at best practices, evidence best practices that were existing across the nation and realized there were no evidence best, best pra evidence based best practices for this group of children to find out how can we find them a families most effectively and most quickly. So we gathered together what were some promising practices and created what we call child focused recruitment. And we gathered with one of our best philanthropic partners as an independent nonprofit public charity. Um, one of our best partners is the Wendy's system, right? And we asked them to help us raise as much money as we could so that we could do two things. Hire those resources that are necessary for adoption agencies, public and private across the nation, and then give them this model. And this model says, carry a smaller caseload of children as an adoption professional. Focus on the longest waiting children in your community. Get to know those children intimately. Everything about their story and their journey that has occurred to date. Connect with all the people in the child's life. Do a deep dive into that case file and the journey the child has already experienced. And then find an adoptive family. And we knew that within that strategy, we could find adoptive families. And the reality is we can. We're now supporting 207 recruiters across North America, including four right here in Ontario. And the model works. More than 12,000 children have been served. Two thirds of those children have had a family identified. 4,800 4, of those children have been adopted. Another 700 are in their pre-adopted placement. And those numbers are even more compelling when you drill down and look at the dynamics of these children. They are age 12 or older. 43% of these adopted children are in sibling groups. 48% of these adopted children have at least one clinically identified disability. 12% of these children uh, were adopted from congregate or institutional care. 20% of these children, before they landed on the child-focused recruitment caseloads, had already had a failed adoption and were put back into the system. This program is working. And we saw the numbers working, but we also knew that we had to look at an evidence-based level. So in 2006, we engaged a preeminent child welfare research organization and said, apply rigorous research to this model. If it works, we're going to grow the program. If it doesn't, we're going to step away. Child welfare does not need another anecdotally-based program. And what we found in 2011 when the research was released was that this model, on average, works 170% better than business as usual. And counterintuitively, for those very children we wanted it to work for, it works up to 300 times better. Unadoptable, we now know, is unacceptable, as are the attitudes that we apply to children, because we can make these programs work, but if adults believe that sibling groups are too much of a burden, or that children are too old to live in a family, they're too set in their ways, or that children are unlovable because of what they've experienced, or that children are too much trouble, then the programs are not going to work. So while we're changing practice, we're looking at changing attitudes too. Unadoptable is unacceptable at every level. We have a program that works, change is happening in North America, and we know that it works. I don't know about you, but I'm a ridiculous movie fanatic. And the one movie that stays with me as an advocate is 
The Wizard of Oz, and as Dorothy in her quest for home, at one point in that movie, she clicks her heels, and almost in a prayer-like stance, she says, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. In my job, I have the rare opportunity and the honor and the privilege to travel across North America. And there are times, though, this week in particular, I've been in Toronto and New York City and back to Toronto and Chicago. There are times on the last trip back out, as much as I love seeing and greeting so many people, I pretty much just want to get into my center seat on Southwest and plug up my earphones, right? At the top of my playlist is my home playlist. And at the top of that home playlist, because I'm an old lady, is Michael Buble croning, I want to go home. I just want to go home. At the end of the day, home is where we all want to be. At the end of this day, we want to go home to those who love us most, to those who will say, you were fine. You didn't talk too fast. You didn't stumble over your words. I'm sure it was fine. That's where we all want to be. That we would systematically and by policy deny that to hundreds of thousands of children across North America is no longer acceptable, I know, to anyone in this room. It's certainly no longer acceptable to the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Unadoptable is unacceptable, and I am grateful for all of you joining us in that journey. Thank you. Thank you.